Hey family, oh we have something to talk about today. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? <laughs> Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Oh, we're going to deal with these movies. We're going to deal with these tropes because we're not going to stop being voracious consumers a recent Nielsen poll says we're voracious consumers of all types of media, including social networking by way of smartphones, tablets, audio, video, movies, TV. We spend 11 hours a week, for instance, on TV, says a 2022 Nielsen report. And I don't believe we're going to stop. So if we're going to consume so much of this type of media, including what you're looking at right now, if we're going to keep consuming it. Shouldn't it be nutritional and value? Shouldn't it have nutritional value for our mental state, for our psychological state, for our health, which is wealth? Yes. So let's consider it. Because I don't think we consider it enough. I think we just have this, particularly with black movies or movies with a lot of black folks in it, I should say, we have this tendency to be like, well, it's, if, it's, if it's a black story, if there's black actors in it, then, then we have to support it. No, 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 not if it's not of value, not if it's harmful mentally, not if it's got ridiculous tropes and minstrel shows and stupidity in it or it defames the character of our woman or ourselves we, we have a right to demand the highest of our art and of our artists so we got to first understand these tropes right because maybe i i think maybe sometimes we don't even notice them because I got to tell you, when I was doing the research, I, I learned a lot. There were things that I didn't necessarily see in the way that I, I've, I've since understood it. And I just want to present it to you so that we can have a good discussion about these images that are flying into our spirits, <laughs> into our mind. I want to have a thought. I want you to understand the tropes and then I want to have a I want to have us think about how our need to be entertained and let's be real these about it. it. It is. Sometimes these movies, for the sake of entertainment, I think we put our dignity down. So what we need to do, in my opinion, what we will do is we're going to develop a criteria by which we rate movies. A, a criteria that's that's a that's going to look at these tropes and, and, and how well these movies deal with navigating stories without causing us to look like idiots or sapphires or minstrels or mammies. Let's get with it. Let's get right into it. So the unlucky 13 13 Black Tropes in Film. Are you ready? The first tropes are going to be are going to be tropes that typically they're exclusive to, to our women. And what do I mean? Let's get right to it. First trope is going to be the sapphire. Oh, the sapphire trope. Oh, goodness. We're not here to castigate any actors, by the way, especially young ones. 
We're being critical of the white male and female gaze primarily and even the black male and female gaze at times that creates these tropes as norms for us. The Sapphire character's projection of the white male and female rape victims during enslavement. It is a projection because instead of looking at their own misgivings, at their own deeds of rape and mutilation, they want they wanted it to look as if our women and men are hypersexualized. Um, in other words, they, they wanted this. This is this was to excuse their heinous deeds. These are the this is the the epicenter of the sapphire type of trope. This is the history of it. And then the name itself comes from the early 1900s. Sapphire Stevens, big up to Ferris State. Uh, they have a Jim Crow museum. A lot of the research I was able to get from that. Anyway, the the Sapphire Stevens character was Kingfish Stevens' wife. We we're talking about those, uh, that Amos and Andy, and Kingfish was one of the main characters there. And his wife regularly berated him, and her name was Sapphire Stevens, so this became this, this Sapphire image. Other notable Sapphires on Esther, Florence from the Jeffersons, modern Sapphire, Sapphires now have even morphed into this angry black woman trope. There's, they remain to be hypersexualized and a good example would be in the movie coffee that we have depicted here by Pam Greer. Again, none of this, we're, we're not aiming this at actors, actresses. We're saying that the system that we're sitting inside of has typically because of the white male gaze, because of these movies, they had to be greenlit by white men mostly, and then later on, even white women, and then later on, black men and black women were, were just as complicit. But we want to deal with the, this from the standpoint of the system, the systematic issues. And we're not, I don't want to lump, I don't want to, I don't want to really lump any heaps of coal on these actors and actresses. Most of the black exploitation, black exploitation, as it was called, genre included black women as the sapphire character. Think about some modern sapphire characters. Any come to mind? The next trope is this mammy trope, and again, this mammy is a projection, y'all. This it's coming out of enslavement. And it was in hyperdrive during Jim Crow. And it holds that black women could only be subservient. It really was seeking to rationalize economic discrimination. It sought to soften these atrocities of Jim Crow and enslavement by depicting the servant as loyal, happy. She doesn't even want to be free. She would never leave me. She doesn't want to leave me. And they don't have a a need, a want, a desire to increase their life or station. They're happy just being my servant. Now, history is full of these depictions in film and TV. Nell Carter just came to mind. It was so egregious to me because in this case, it wasn't even like the white male in this case was upper class. This is a modern, uh, modern depiction of an ex-cop who's basically middle class and took on uh, the the character that Nell Carter played as a, as a maid. The most sad depiction today, black men are the mammies. So you look at like Big Mama's house and Martin Lawrence and the whole Medea saga that Tyler Perry has beset upon us. Lord, more on TP later. Eddie as a mother and not a professor, and then Eddie again as Respucia, and that's that, oh man, that debacle Norbert. Shame, shame. Any others? Any others come to mind? There's so many. But that's the, this mammy trope that she's just intensely royal, loyal, royal, intensely loyal to these white families, even above her own.
Another trope we want to look at is the hyper masculine machine gun toting woman. This is this is kind of contrasting from the sapphire, and that this angry black woman is devoid of any softness. It's on that slippery, that slippery white feminist propagandistic trope of we you don't, you don't need a man. <laughs> um, depicts our women as animalistic, savage. Of course, it's a holdover from enslavement. And there's a, a male counterpart to it that we'll talk about too, but it's a holdover from enslavement as well as, as it's a projection from the white male and female, their beastly urges upon the enslaved. And it, it helps them not to have to look at their own carnal proclivities. That's the hyper masculine woman trope. And then we gotta we gotta deal with our typically exclusive man trope. So if we dealt with the hyper masculine woman on the woman trope side, then we gotta deal with the feminized black man trope. This is this is the emasculated black male character. It's an unfortunate holdover from buck busting and enslavement where the white slaveholders would sodomize black men or have them sodomized to break them. Thus it was safer for a black man to be effeminate. It was a way for it was a survival tactic. But now the shame of it is that we're you know, we're doing it in the form in the form of and because of entertainment. So Tyler Perry characters such as Madea and hosts of others throughout film and TV, Geraldine and Flip Wilson for uh, Flip Wilson as Geraldine comes to mind. A spinoff is the infantilization of the black man. So it's the baby boy syndrome. So it's just anything where the black man can't be can't be masculine, can't be a man. Any others come to mind? So next, got this angry black man type. This is the black man as the demon. He's abusive. He's there's no redemption in him. Rapist, murderer, well, any ill repute is is hung upon him, and yet other characters are emotionally layered and they're able to be redemptive. Does this come to mind? It's another projection of enslavement and Jim Crow and beyond. It's typified in movies where redeeming characters come in every other form but the black man. Color purple comes to mind. More recently, what's depicted here is Harriet's non-factual slave catcher named Bigger Long. That part, I family, we we have got it. We, we cannot let Hollywood do this to us. How are we going to let a non-black, a non-black writer pin a movie with a character named Bigger Long? You know, <laughs> Doctor Wilson, Doctor Francis Gross Wilson, she spoke about. She spoke about this this preoccupation that the white man and the white woman have with the male phallic symbol. And this, to me, is, I mean, this is an egregious depiction of it. How can you name this man big or long in the middle of a movie about Harriet Tubman? Come on. We, we got to do better. Shame, shame on anyone who had anything to do with this movie. Shame on you. Shame. Another type is the black buck. And this black buck, of course it comes from enslavement when unfortunately our our brothers were, our forefathers in this case were actually sodomized in many cases 
And so anyway, so you have this this aggressive, savage, mischievous, and violent criminal, and they're usually prone to be over sex. So here again, this is a projection of the white male's proclivities onto the black man because the the violence and aggressiveness and savagery was at the white male's hand, and the white woman in this case was complicit. This is history. This is facts, y'all. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but these characters, this is why it's so important. You know, I, I know folks have, a, oh, it's just a movie. We have a, uh, we have a bad habit of saying this. It's, it's not. It's more than just a movie. These become, these can become in the wrong hands a part of the new history. It can become the way that black men and women are viewed around the world. I can't tell you how many times I've been in travels and someone has said someone has said something like someone said to me something like, Well, yeah, I I, I learned my I learned from some rap song or from some movie about about the the black culture um and it's never you know like the the learning unfortunate part about it whenever it's talked about i just think about going golfing in ghana lovely ghana and i can remember the erudite phd i think he was educated in england ghanaian said something about oh you're from New Orleans that's the <laughs> that's the home of little Wayne and I'm like it's not <laughs> you know it, it couldn't be th that's the home of Louis Armstrong or you know what I mean that's the home of Dutch Morial all these illuminaries that that's the home of little Wayne Oh, goodness, and see, this is what I'm saying. This, I we can't we can't keep saying, oh, that's that's just a song, that's just music. This, these images become how we're viewed by others, not only in this land but in other lands. Okay, so that's the black book. Next, we want to talk about some interchangeable tropes. They're put upon our, our women and our men, our black women and our black men. Let's look at some interchangeable tropes that Hollywood throws on us. Oh, yeah. The magic Negro. Thank you, brother Spike Lee. So he, he coined this phrase. This is a supporting character who has some special insights through mysticism or some other spiritual or supernatural powers. And why do they use them? To help their people get better? To help the plight of black people? No, no. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people? No. No, no. Something that's only going to benefit black people? No. No, no. They use it to help their white protagonists to gain some advantage. To, In the case of the movie Ghost with with a Whoopi Goldberg character, Whoopi Goldberg's character there to, to help the white protagonist get to see his wife or get to have an experience with his dead wife. In the case of of Bagger Vance shown there on the right, uh, an opportunity for Bagger Vance to just somehow mystically appear from out of the Georgia pines and help the white protagonist to win a golf match. <laughs> oh, I it, this is true. This is this, these are the premises of these movies. It, it often bastardizes or just outright disrespects Caribbean and West African faiths such as voodoo or, or Ifa. I mean, if you're going to talk about it, then represent it the right way. And then, as I said before, the, the powers aren't used to help the plight of black people. They're used to help the plight, the plight of white protagonists. All right, there you go on that one. 
So we're going to talk about the Magic Negro. Guess what we're going to talk about next? You guessed it. The White Savior. This is a strong-willed character. It hops past every activist, and neighborhood teacher, and parent. And, and it hops past all of them to help some downtrodden black character. I mean, <laughs> you would think that there's no one... I mean, I just, in my lifetime, how many people could I name? I mean, oh, Mrs. Chapital, my English teacher. I could name uh, Dr. Fluker, my history teacher in Tuskegee. I can name Dr. Tolan, another history teacher in Tuskegee. I can name my mother. I can name my grandmother. I mean, there are so many people I can name. <laughs> and I know this is the, this is the lived experience for many black Americans. There's always someone in the neighborhood that's there, that's an angel there, that's been there for years, that helps the plight of black people. But oh no, Hollywood can't have that. You gotta have some some white character, some white angel that descends upon the inner city. The unfortunate part is that In these cases, in the case of these two movies, right? So the movie on the left is The Blind Side. The man in the movie, the young black benefactor of the white savior in this case, he certainly was homeless. He went from homeless to being an NFL success, but he did so on his own merits and on the merits of those, those black folks that helped him in those neighborhoods. They just made this up. Another movie that rewrites history is is hidden figures that's on the right. This whole character here, you know, I mean, this Kevin Costner character wasn't even real, y'all. Katherine Johnson battled racism and the lack of a bathroom that was proximate for her on her own, along with those other black ladies. And when confronted, the writer, you know what the screenwriter said? The screenwriter of hidden, hidden figures? Oh, they just needed to be a they just needed to be white people doing the right thing. White savior. Stark contrast to the black devil, this black demon character, where we just we're just gonna make up a black demon character, right? See, we got this is what I'm saying, y'all. This is real stuff. It's hard to speak of white saviorism without talking about these ubiquitous white Jesus pictures that were in the homes of black folks circa 70s, 60s, and 80s. Hopefully, they got out of the homes by the 80s. Uh, but even if they did get out of the homes, my, my Nigerian brothers and sisters, your government, <laughs> this is, you, you can't hardly believe this. You won't believe this. The Nigerian government contracted a Chinese sculptor to make a white Jesus monument. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this up. I'm just shaking my head. But yeah, that, that one on the right, that's the, that's the white Jesus large, super huge statue that, that, uh, that towers over. <laughs> towers over Nigeria. Oh, help us. Anyway, comment on that, if you will. Next trope is the minstrel. This, this too is a holdover from enslavement. Those, those, um, those hardworking people during enslavement, you're going to make them, the white supremacy is going to make them out like they were, like these people were lazy. And they, they continue this trope today. These people who toiled in those fields without pay for 400 years and then and then were the negative benefactors of sharecropping and then Jim Crow and all of these other atrocities you, you're going to call them lazy ignorant clowns sexually promiscuous docile and just happy for no reason no they don't mind being slaves while well, villain minstrel shows in the early 1900s Jim Crow character being one of them put white men in blackface with exaggerated mouths and face paint. 
Yeah, Jim Crow. That's where it came from. See, that's what I'm saying. We keep having this saying, oh, it's just movies or it's just entertainment. It's not just entertainment. Whole movements have been started from movies and from characters like this. And it still plagues us even today. This is a modern day Gucci ad on the left where they thought that someone, or some, a bunch of someone's at Gucci thought it was acceptable to have this modern day blackface sweater. <clears throat> and then top left in the movies, you have Eddie, 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 Eddie. Oh my goodness. Eddie playing a donkey in Shrek. And that donkey is just so stepping, fetching, and, and skinning and grinning. I, I don't know why. I don't know why Eddie did it. But uh, like I said, we're not going to castigate. I don't know. But Eddie. <laughs> It's like Eddie's different. I don't know. It's like Eddie should know better. Um, all right. Anyway, Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars is another character that's super problematic at the time. Uh, I can remember writing. You know how far back this goes. I can remember writing a letter to the Detroit Free Press at the time about uh, Jar Jar Binks comic strip that was in the newspaper with all that Stepping and fetching. It's out, outrageous. So that's the minstrel. Kissing cousin to the minstrel would be just the flat out sellout. Now some colloquialisms will call this the Tom or Sambo. In my research I found that there's some cases where maybe either of them weren't necessarily sellouts. Um, and so I don't want to so I don't want to Further that that negative stereotype using those names, we just call them sellout. We under, we understand what it is. It's a holdover from enslavement. These were the trustees or the house servants. They they had they really had no status. The only status they had is that they were over other black people, akin to the minstrel. But they were they were more shrewd. This black character is bent on upholding white supremacist ideals especially when it means to denigrate other black people. Steven's character in the Django Unchained, you see Steven looking around the looking around the bend there? That is a quintessential sellout character. Followed a uh, close second, maybe not even, but followed by Mrs. Tate and Antoine Fisher. You remember that character? She kept using the N-word over and over again to, to describe Antoine Fisher and his and his brothers. That is the sellout character. They, they put that one on us as well, y'all. Number nine, the sellout. Number 10, colorism. We've got to deal with this. this. This term is attributed to Alice Walker as she described and characterized those who use those who are in the same race being given preferred treatment due to some lighter hue. In movies, it's the preferential characterization of those in the same race based on skin color while tacitly ignoring the social ramifications replete in this characterization. So if you look at the movie Nina, oh boy. So, so problematic. It, it just denigrates the humanity of one of our icons, Nina Simone here. And it's, it was an erasure. It, it just was. By using Zoe Saldana there, who's lighter skinned and making her put on blackface and, and a prosthetic nose it, it is to it was to denigrate the life and the legacy of Nina why would you do a movie that is supposedly honoring her and dishonor her so you do it because you don't understand colorism I should have never played Nina um, I should have done everything in my power with the leverage that I had 10 years ago 
which was a different leverage, but it was leverage nonetheless. I should have tried everything in my power to cast a black woman to play an exceptionally perfect black woman. Yeah. Uh, th uh, that, it's you know, growing, it's painful. I thought back then that, I thought back then that I, I was, I, 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 had, I had the permission because I was a black woman and I am, but I, but it was Nina Simone and Nina had a life and she had a journey that should have been, and it should be honored to the most specific detail because she was a specifically detailed individual about her voice and her opinions and her views and her music and her art and she was so honest so she deserved better and but that said so I'm sorry I'm so sorry because I love her music but it wasn't enough it shouldn't have been enough same thing in Chef and it can go by. So this is one like, so this is one like at the top when I was saying, I might not have even noticed it before. But if you think about it in Shaft, Priest, both of them were criminals now, but Priest is the one that's got the plan. He's the one that's going to get out. He's the one that makes the plan to get out of the rat race. And then Eddie, his dark skinned sidekick, is the one that ends up turncoating on him in the end. And was kind of his, his, pun intended, his shadow. You see that? You see how even we, we as writers, this was written by and directed by Gordon Parks, even we as writers, we have to be careful that we don't fall into these white supremacist tropes. So this one is the trope of colorism. Speaking of tropes that we shouldn't fall into. We, we got to talk about this, brothers. Um, let me use winch here. Instead of the B word, it, I just, I, I want it to be acceptable in case you want to show your, your children or your classrooms. So I'm just going to use winch. It's the constant barrage of epithets aimed at black women by black men in film. Also, it's a heightened portrayal of sex workers in a negative light while catering to the white or black male gaze. As with other tropes, it's when a line of art is crossed in the exploitation for capital gain. It's no less patriarchal when it's written or directed by the black man. And we, we just got to face that. We got to check our patriarchy, black men. And these are, this is one easy, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have any argument on this. I mean, later on, Ice Cube wrote much better movies and told much better stories. This one, in retrospect, this is one, this wasn't his best work. The one on that, so that was Players Club on the left. And then on the right is Hustle and Flow. Interestingly enough, Hustle and Flow is written by a white man. I don't, I, I'm, I've been dealing with that. I don't know if that's better or worse. It's not good either way. Just the thought, though, that a white man has the, believes that he has the agency to call our women bees and, 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 H words and why do they have the agency well because we're calling them B's and H words and rapping and, and film we're, we're giving an entree to that and we have to do better look much of you've heard me I, I keep saying it over and over again so I don't want to hear detractors saying about well I don't understand white supremacy and racism because I do and I'm, I'm pointing it out over and over again but when you take out your pen and and you write a script and or you write a rap 
and is calling our woman B's and, and H words, that's what's the white supremacy in that? Except unless you tell me it's some white supremacy that has you mentally stunted, your growth is stunted. So let's not have stunted growth. Let's get beyond that, right? We can make art without denigrating our women. All I'm going to say about that. All right, next I want to show some contrast. Before I would show kind of one depiction and talk about a movie, uh, or I would show a couple movies that, that are dealing with the same type of trope, this one... We're going to deal with some issues here. We've got to deal with the issues now. And they're hot button issues. And they can cause some folks to feel pain. I don't want you to feel pain. So I want to show a contrast so that you can feel the love. Okay, let's deal with it. The first is LBTQ fan service. So anytime, any fan service is when when an artist is just taking direction from their fans specifically to make them pleased with a work, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's like being commissioned, I guess, as an artist, or it's like taking um, recommendations. Like say, if you're a, just giving examples, right? It's, it's like, say if you're a, a lounge singer, oh, what, what do you want to hear next? That, that's fan service. That in and of itself, there's nothing wrong about that. It becomes troublesome when it sacrifices the historical accuracy of real people. It also becomes problematic, artistically speaking, when it defies your own established story arc. So let's deal with it. So the unfortunate retelling of black icons of the West in this movie, Harder They Fall, portrays our iconic, wonderful, beautiful stagecoach Annie there left. It in the portrayal in the movie, they portrayed her as a lesbian when actually there's no evidence that stagecoach Annie was a lesbian. So why would you do that? If you don't know, just why, why would you just willy nilly make her? that that's not right and that's fan service that's saying okay there's going to there's an audience there's an lgbtq audience and i'm just going to write in this characteristic upon this character just to serve that audience that's not right this is a real woman and she deserves to have her story told correctly and if you can't tell it correctly don't tell it What's the contrast from that, right? Because our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community deserve to have their stories told. Here's a contrast. Look at this scene. This is a character, Omar, from a famous, some say it's, some argue that it's the best TV program ever of all time. But that notwithstanding, the character Omar is a, a, a sort of a Robin Hood character. He um he robs from drug dealers, and this character is nuanced. He has depth. Um, boy, his that courtroom scene is one of the best ever. He totally uh, he totally undressed mentally the prosecutor there. But beyond this, the depth and beyond that, he's gay. And he's openly gay. And as you can see the scene here, that was that was one of his lovers. I almost it's like it's been so long. Do I have to do I have to say spoilers? Goodness gracious. But anyway, <laughs> something untoward happens to his lover. Um, but it was do you hear how I'm telling it? It's central to the story. Him being a homosexual is central to the story. His lover being killed causes him, causes a, a chain of events that is central to the story arc.
it's not just shoehorn in. It's not just fan service. It's not just thrust upon someone that has a historical story just for fan service. Can you tell, can you see the difference in that? And that's what I'm talking about. That's what we mean. When, when you hear someone says, oh, oh my goodness, they just, they just threw someone gay in there again. I, I want you to think, you know, I, I want you to don't, don't just think it's hatred first. We, we ought to have to be able to have a discussion about these things. Okay, let's deal with another. If that's not controversial enough, let's talk about this one. White feminist fan service. First, we got. I think we got to deal with, I, maybe you didn't even know there's, there's white feminism and, and non-white feminism. I think we have to pay homage to Miss Kimberly Crenshaw. Oh, my, oh, my word. Miss Kimberly Crenshaw is an African-American scholar and lawyer and activist and she coined this phrase intersectionality so it deals with overlap of social identities so it deals with the fact that you can be a feminist and that holds with it its its identity and then you can be a black feminist and that's that holds with it Maybe some of the same as a white feminist is, but certainly there's a myriad of other identities that a black feminist would hold that a white one would not. And because this is the case, can you see why it would be very important for anyone who's sitting down writing a story about black women and trying to trying to really capture their humanity, their femininity, their unique place on the planet, they should at least know, look, there's a difference. No, we're not the same. This whole flattening of everyone as we're all the same. No, we're we're not the same. We're culturally dis different. This is a statement of beauty, actually. To understand and to be empathizing with someone else's culture, this is beautiful. So white feminist fan service is when you write narratives for the express purpose of placating to the white feminist community with white feminist sensibilities while sacrificing historical accuracy and established story arc and matters that are unique to the black woman's struggle. This is, the help is one, they've got, you, you can look it up. I mean, they came under much attack for this. This white woman writer, she, I, okay, I'm, I'm applauding. I'm applauding our sisters. I'm applauding because it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's utterly ridiculous to think that the lived experience of a white woman and a black servant would be the same and that she's just happy to be, a, to be in the service. It's utterly ridiculous. In contrast, when you get it right, <laughs> in contrast, oh, look at those beautiful... Oh, man, what a wonderful movie, King Richard. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Serena and Venus. Bless you so much. What a wonderful movie. And it shows strong black women. These are the primary characters of the movie, along with Richard, but they were, they were strong. They had their own minds. They had their own wills even in, as, teenager, as teenagers, and it, it showed through. Big up to Miss Orsine, the mother as well. 
So it shows how the strength of a black woman can happen in concert and, to be honest, sometimes in conflict, but with black men. It, the movie showed that we're not in competition. I mean, this brother put his all into training these two champions. And it is when he learned to hear them that his family was better for it. And this was the pinnacle. This was the key to the entire movie. This is a rare, rare find in movie. -dom. Can you see the difference? Can you see the difference? Black femininity, black feminist, white feminist, can you see the difference? It's as stark as the difference between a writer writing a movie called The Help and another writer writing a movie called King Richard about these, which really wasn't as much about Richard as it was about these three strong women. As an aside, guess who were guess who got upset at the movie? King Richard. White feminists. They don't understand. This is why I get I I wanna be better, you all. I, I wanna be better. This is the whole this is the whole crux of the matter of Young Wealthy and Black Academy. It's about being better. It's about us all being better. In all ways, not just monetary wealth, but health wealth, mental wealth, psychological. So I want to check my patriarchy. You see evidence of it here. I want to. I want to check my own. If there's a shred of sexism within me, I want to check it. And so, with love and with patience, for the life of me, I cannot see why our sisters sometimes align with white feminism. It's not your lived experience. I don't understand it. Maybe this will help. Maybe you didn't even know about intersectionalism. Maybe you didn't even know about our dear sister, Kimberly Crenshaw. Look her up. She's doing, she has done the work. She is doing the work. Okay. If that's not controversial enough for you, <laughs> we're gonna get on down here. Let's deal with let's deal with what I'm gonna call Nikki Rosa type one. Nikki Rosa, oh boy. If you have not heard the poem Nikki Rosa by our beloved, our special, our icon, writer. G of uh, Nikki Giovanni, if you haven't read that poem, please read Nikki Rosa. It's an autobiographical tale. In essence, it begs for Nikki Giovanni's story to be told right and not white. Childhood remembrances are always a drag if you're black. You always remember things like living in Woodlawn with no indoor toilet. And if you become famous or something, they never talk about how happy you were to have your mother all to yourself and how good the water felt when you got your bath from one of those big tubs that folk in Chicago barbecue in. And somehow, when you talk about home, it never gets across how much you understood their feelings as the whole family attended meetings about Hollydale. And even though you remember, your biographers never understand your father's pain as he sells his stock and another dream goes. And though you're poor, it isn't poverty that concerns you. And though they fought a lot, it isn't your father's drinking that makes any difference, but only that everybody is together. And you and your sister have happy birthdays and very good Christmases. And I really hope no white person ever has cause to write about me because they never understand black love is black wealth. And they'll probably talk about my hard childhood and never understand that all the while, I was quite happy. Because she knew then when she wrote it, and it was the case then, as is the case now, as was the case in antiquity, as is the case in the future, I'm sure, in the short future. We're going to change it in the distant future, though, right? 
There's a deluge of white writers of black stories. And they often knowingly, and you know, maybe sometimes unknowingly, maybe, maybe they have a good heart, but they often get it wrong and often create something that sullies the good name of the person or the people that they're depicting. The movie Nina is a perfect example of this. It was written by Cynthia Mort, the white lady, rose of fame as a writer in Roseanne. And then she, t you know, she wrote some other things, and then she takes on, <laughs> she takes on Nina Simone. And so this is, this is what I'm talking about, y'all. Like we need to develop our own governing body so that this can never happen. This Nikki Rosa type one, where a white writer takes on an iconic, nuanced character such as Nina Simone, I mean, it needs to be vetted to the utmost, and it was not. And we know it wasn't because, first of all, they cast a light-skinned actress, Zoe Saldana. This woman's entire life, Nina Simone's entire life, was fighting against, oh, fighting against isms, sexism, racism, colorism. And then you, you cast a light skin. We're not, look, I'm not castigating Miss Saldana because she's since apologized. But the, the, let's call them the showrunners. You cast a light skin woman that has to put on blackface and a prosthetic nose to play our beautiful, black, iconic sister, Nina Simone? Shame on you. Shame. It wasn't right. Contrast this. Oh, it's so beautiful when it's done right. That's what it, why it's worth fighting for. Oh, man. We have such great writers. August Wilson <laughs> is certainly on the Mount Rushmore of black writers. He penned fences in his series. Do you know this man wrote a play for every decade of the 1900s? Whew. Man, what a writer. So he wrote the play fences. Then the movie is so captured black American life. I mean, to witness the play in the movie, it's like, it's like, as a black person, it's like being in your own backyard. Bravo. Man, follow the Davis. Oh. <laughs> oh, she did such a wonderful job acting this alongside of Denzel. Another, I mean, when it's done right, it's worth fighting for. God bless you, Denzel. I know you fought for this. It's worth fighting for us to be depicted with the, the majesty and the honor and the respect and the fragility. We don't get everything right, but put it all up there and put it up there in a way that causes us to reflect and to love who we are. Nikki Rosa type two. I put this one last and I want to deal with it with much love and patience and care. There is a proliferation of foreign born black actors taking on iconic and historic American black roles. It's, um, it's at a fever pitch, and it's, it's, it's just beyond acceptability. Again, this is not aimed at any one actor or actress. It's yet another trick of white supremacy, and it's hinge, it hinges on the so-called model immigrant. So it's, it's just a better black proxy than, than those who toil these lands of enslavement. It's like, I'm, 
I'm going to just go get me another black person. Even to play roles of iconic black American who were formerly enslaved, we're, we'll, we'll just go get someone else so that we don't have to deal with, we don't have to deal with looking at you. We don't have to deal with the pain that is in your eyes as you play these roles. I'm saying that it's at least time to say why. Why is this happening? Why is the former enslaved black person on this land so low as not to be able to tell their own story? The only ones could tell our story are, are foreign-born black people or, or white women or white men. Why, why, why are we not allowed to tell our own story? There's a myriad of black writers, myriad of black actors. What's going on? I would ask that I would say that true Pan-Africanism would look at this and ask the question, why as well? Any of my brothers and sisters that are not born in the United States, I would hope that you were asking why too. And yeah, of course it works both ways. Why would an American-born actor have to travel to Caribbean, travel to Africa to play an iconic African when there are so many there that could play that role and could play it with the depth and the tribal history and the culture that it deserves? I would ask why of the same thing. And I would also say, and, and, and stop getting people's dialect all messed up. I mean, what, what Morgan Freeman did in Invictus, was, I mean, that was just criminal. Let's focus here. <laughs> Again, I want to tell, I want to say, look, Miss Arrivo is a fine actress, and I hope that her own negative words towards black American women, have, I hope it spurred some soul searching on her part. I'm not here to to castigate her. I just want to say why. And, and when we do that, then perhaps when the role of Ms. Tubman is being played, there won't be this magical Negro-like leaning towards spirituality as if she was superhuman and this made her a conductor for her people. No, no, she was very human, felt pain all her life. In fact, experienced a, 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 an anvil being lobbed against her head so that she dealt with seizures her entire life and still she was able to do this no she was very human and she was able to do this this is a better story you see contrast this with the people versus billy holiday written by a black american playwright directed by a black man the black american playwright was suzanne lori parks titled role to the washington born miss andra day did a wonderfully fabulous job on this Billie Holiday. I want to have some closing thoughts here. There may be other tropes that I didn't mention, but I think these are the, they pretty much cover the gamut and it sets up a nice framework to deal with a balanced approach to, critic, to critiquing black Movies. I'm doing black movies in, in quotes because we know sometimes they're black facing and, and sometimes there's blacks in front of the camera and none behind it. But it, it, at any rate, anything that any movie that's marketed to blacks about blacks, we need to be able to critique these things. An approach that doesn't sacrifice our hard fought dignity for the sake of entertainment. 
for the birth of a nation too was entertainment and it birthed the KKK.